It's always a sad day when a video game gets cancelled, and it happens way more than you think. For every high-profile Silent Hills publicly getting the can, there's hundreds of lesser knowns and prototypes that don't see the light of day. I think that we've all got our white whales, games that you were really looking forward to that ended up failing to hit store shelves. Well, at least until someone happens to randomly leak it onto the internet 10 years later. Like Star Wars Battlefront 3 or Glover 2. Everyone's holy grail. It's like when you find out that there was a Game Boy Color version of South Park Park that was not only cancelled, but fully done. Turns out nobody involved wanted to release something for adults on a portable where the average owner's age was probably 8. And not just that, but it got reworked into two separate games, Maya the Bee and Mary-Kate and Ashley Get a Clue. But because of modern technology and archivists, you can pop this thing in and watch Kenny get smashed by a meteor in the palm of your emulation device, complete with bit-crushed audio. There's a lot of speculation on what could have been with a lot of these unreleased and cancelled games. Prototype leaks just make it worse, especially when they're practically finished like Star Fox 2. Like many others, I was so ready for that Mega Man Legends 3 demo to pop out on the 3DS, but we're coming up on 12 years now without any relief. There's no leak in sight, so I guess us Mega Man fans get to stay losing. A uh, tradition at this point. Be they scrapped early on, nearly completed, or just cancelled for no reason, there's tons of video games to talk about, a lot of which are now playable due to some sneaky shenanigans. Did we ever think that we would actually have the opportunity to play StarCraft Ghost? Nope but I did, and we're gonna talk about it. Steven Seagal, we've talked about you like three times now, so you, you can stay. So yo, it's Austin, and today we're gonna be jumping headfirst into the horribly unoptimized and glitchy world of canceled video games. Thanks to the power of emulation and a couple of crazy people on the internet, we can play a bunch of stuff that would have otherwise never seen the light of day. Which also means I'm not gonna be too harsh on them. Most of these are just concepts anyway, and you know, ultimately got the ax, so I'm not gonna treat it like a full game. But you know what else got a sharp pointy bit? And by that I mean a fork. Food. And a word from today's sponsor, Factor. This summer is hot. Sometimes nice, other times scorching, and when I want to cut back on travel during these busy days, I can always rely on Factor. Factor's nutritional, fresh, never frozen meals are ready in just two minutes, and for the busy person on the go, this is a great solution. Factor is a great way to try and refresh those healthy habits in a jiffy. Each week, there's over 34 flavor packed, dietitian approved meals, be it vegetarian, vegan, keto, calorie smart, or just wanting a lot of protein. Protein. These things are really easy to prepare. You just unbox it, pop it in the oven or the microwave, and let the heat do its thing. Put it on a plate if you want, and kick back. This week, I was a big fan of the vegetarian green chili tostada bake. It's got a corn salsa and a little sour cream you can pour on. It's got that homemade Tex-Mex flair, but without the ridiculous amounts of calories. Vector also has other nutritious options like snack add-ons or these smoothies, which I love keeping stocked in my fridge. These things are great on the go. Vector is also owned by HelloFresh, who we've also done a deal with in the past. And between the two brands, there's plenty of options out there from anyone looking to have a meal. So head to Factor75.com and use the code eruption50 to get 50% off your very first Factor Box. That's Eruption 50 for 50% 50 off today. Thanks so much to Factor for the sponsor, but for now we need to head back to a bunch of sketchy websites and download some EXEs that may or may not work as we talk about a bunch of unreleased and cancelled video games. I figured, hey, why don't we get this started with some of the weirdest stuff that you probably haven't heard of, for example, Bioforce Ape. AKA Sonic, but faster. Bioforce Ape is a story. It's a game that was on display at CES. It was shown off in Nintendo Power and was subsequently canceled within a year. You can never really tell what a game's supposed to play like from the screenshots, but this thing was weird. You play as the Bioforce Ape, a monkey turned into a werehuman who runs around beating the crap out of every other anthropomorphic thing in sight. There's a lot of animation frames here, especially when falling, which is also like something that happens a lot. <laughs> Level design here is a bit egregious. Bioforce Ape is actually playable from start to finish, and it's really uncertain why Seta Inc. canceled this thing. It's probably the whole NES game in 1992 thing, but I thought it was pretty decent. The beat em up mechanics are really simple, but there's fun wrestling inspired finishers to combos. You better be prepared to get bodied in the corner though. To death, but hey, it was never released, so complaining's not technically allowed. This thing's even got a happy ending. When were you actually returned to Monkey? This does look pretty decent decent for the time, though I don't think any of the game's sprite work lives up to this promo art. This is incredible.
Speaking of NES games cancelled in 1992, Sunman, who is definitely not Superman, although he was Superman. Sunman is an unreleased Sunsoft game that was a palette swap of a cancelled Soups title, so it essentially got the axe twice. This dude even flies by the Statue of Liberty, the most 80s American superhero thing you can possibly do. Similar to Bioforce, Sunman got itself a leaked prototype that was also playable from start to finish. <laughs> it's like pretty good too. There's a neat stage transition with a bop and NES beat before you do one of two play styles, floating and punching or running and punching. Heat vision, laser eyes, check. Giant green crystals that damage you when you touch them. Gee, I wonder why that happens. There's even little mini games like stopping a moving train. Sunman has a lot more effort than you would expect and I think that it would have been fondly remembered if it was properly released. Look, all I'm saying is there's an alternate universe where Capcom's Captain Commando versus Sunsoft Sunman is one of the hottest crossovers of all time. For who? I'm sure there's someone. There's a decent amount of unreleased and cancelled prototypes from the 8-bit era you can stumble upon, a lot of which have been preserved nicely online, but a lot of these are variations of platformers or like ports of games on other consoles. For example, the Super Nintendo version of SimCity running in the 8-bit dimension. It's crazy impressive, but not too wacky. So let's shoot forward a generation or two, the mid and late 90s, where video games get weird. What happens when you put a two-headed orc inside of a giant wheel with two massive clubs? Well, you get Torque Legend of the Ogre Crown. A terrible name, which is weird because it was originally called Kill Wheel. An awesome name. It was even shown off in magazines as Kill Wheel, so you gotta wonder why they changed it. Torque Legend of the Ogre Crown was being developed by Head Games Publishing, probably most known for their extreme line of games. It was cancelled allegedly due to a lack of quality, which is a shame because the concept and core of what it was is great. Look, you, you drive the kill wheel, you run down peasants and wizards with your massive wheel and clubs and make it to the end of levels leaving nothing but misery in your wake. This feels like such a mid-90s PlayStation 1 era concept that I almost feel nostalgia playing the leaked prototype. Type, and it's even got a lot of stages you can play. There's bosses, different environments, wheels, and weapons, but it is very one note. It's definitely something I think people wouldn't have been too thrilled to spend money on, but a perfect rental for the weekend that you would think about 20 years later. Unfortunately, like countless others, it would never officially see the light of day. So file that one in the weird games that looked fun folder. I think that Kill Wheel would have been a perfect Xbox Live Arcade release, and the closest I think anyone's gotten to doing something similar is probably Rock of Ages. So if you want to mow down the medieval countryside as a comically large object, check that out. Or you know, just download Kill Wheel. Ain't no one gonna stop you. Which actually makes me wonder, there's all kinds of categories of canceled games out there, but what about ones that were like specifically taken to another generation? Be it development hell or just needing a little bit more power, there's tons of cases of video games getting bumped to the next generation. You don't always get a chance to play the original vision, but once again, thanks to some crazy archivists, now you can. Which means, yes, we get to talk about Toe Jam and Earl 3 again on the Dreamcast. It's funky time. <laughs> Toe Jam and Earl 3 Mission to Earth was not a great game. Its theming felt dated on release, the humor constantly missed, and the gameplay is practically lifted straight out of 1991. Which is weird because they took the time to push it to the original Xbox from the Dreamcast. Developer Visual Concepts teamed up with Toe Jam and Earl Productions in order to start to put this thing together, but it was a bit too late as the Dreamcast was going to be meeting its demise shortly after its original public showcase. Lucky for us, a prototype leaked and it's actually got a lot more in common with the Sega Genesis classic. Mission to Earth has you going through a story, navigating a hub world, and beating bigger levels one at a time. The Dreamcast prototype goes full on roguelike elevator climber. Obviously, you can't tell what they wanted to do with this as it's early and only has about 10 playable levels, but it does feel like a decent 3D conversion of a really weird game. I think that this could have potentially been better than the finished product. Sometimes simplicity is key. Also, the music throws down. Check out time. There's a few other cases like this. Rise Son of Rome had a leaked prototype that looked like it was originally gonna be a first person action game akin to Breakdown. No connect required. There were also the original GameCube and Xbox versions of cameo elements of power that were canceled in favor of the seventh generation. Rareware actually has a lot of canned games and unfinished leaks over the last 20 years or so, but their biggest and maybe even saddest has to be Dinosaur Planet, AKA Star Fox Adventures. Minus the, minus the whole Star Fox. 
Fox part. Dinosaur Planet, no, not the Discovery Show with 3D dinos fighting each other, was a Nintendo 64 game that had a lot of notoriety. Near the end of that console's lifespan, we'd start to see these bigger and badder releases like Majora's Mask and Perfect Dark. Rareware was no stranger to putting out killer apps in this time, and in 2000, they'd unveil DP, something with that 3D Zelda energy. The story goes, Shigeru Miyamoto wanted to put Star Fox in a non-rail shooter game, saw Dinosaur Planet, went, put him in the thing, and Star Fox Adventures, Dinosaur Planet was born for just a little bit, then slowly just Star Fox. It got bumped up to the GameCube because it was too late to get on the Nintendo 64, Rare worked with Nintendo to make it fit the Star Fox canon, and what we got was a game that chopped up the original to make it work. Apparently, Miyamoto himself wanted to add sex appeal to the franchise, so Crystal was changed from this to this. Every parent's nightmare in the early 2000s. Dinosaur Planet was considered a long lost memory for well over 20 years until 2021 when old prototypes from the late 2000s leaked onto the net, and these were thick. You're not playing a little bit of a janky dinosaur planet, you've got a full 8 to hour long experience that has a lot of similarities to the final GameCube title. And now, having played it, I gotta say, <laughs> I wish we got this instead. There's two leaks out there, one with the original male protagonist, Saber, and another where Fox McCloud shoehorned his way in, both of which have a large bulk of gameplay. Star Fox Adventures took the world and story from Dino Planet and ripped a lot of it out in favor of random spacey moments, none of which existed in the original. There's no abrasive sounding dinosaur speak, just abrasive British English. My name is Crystal, and I've come for the princess. She's a long way from home. And I'm not sure how, but the Nintendo 64 soundtrack sounds just as good, if not slightly better than the finished GameCube tracks. Similarly to Kill Wheel, Dinosaur Planet feels like something that I grew up playing despite never touching it until 20 years after, and that's a great accomplishment. The biggest difference between this leak and Adventures are definitely the narrative. So many puzzles and levels are identical, and Tricky is still an annoying little shit, but you can tell they spent a lot of time just trying to rework this on Nintendo's behalf. A big shame, because I think Dinosaur Planet's worth playing even in its unfinished state. Plus, instead of a sudden Andros boss, you get to watch General Scales getting robbed after breaking his spine. Speaking of pain, Duke Nukem Forever. No, no, not that one. This one. Duke Nukem Forever was, for years, an urban legend. It was a will-they-won't-they they relationship of 3D realms and finishing a video game. And for a full decade, it was largely up to debate whether this was gonna happen or not. People had pre-order receipts from the early 2000s on this thing. We were all betting on the Duke. The final product is a, well, a greasy hamburger, and old trailers of Duke Nukem Forever were left in the dust, presumably to never be touched or seen again. That is, until some crazy people leaked it onto the internet over 20 years later. Surprising everyone, it was actually pretty okay. This seems to be a common thing here. Duke Nukem Forever 2001, or DNF2K, has a lot in common with Half-Life. The prototype seems like it was going to be following a lot of the same narrative beats and concepts as the finished project, but with that late 90s FPS flair. You want to play some pinball? Go for it. How about a free P button? You got it. What, were you expecting something classy with Duke Nukem? Despite this thing supposedly sucking, surprisingly, the finished product feels worse than the prototype in a lot of ways, and I think part of that is the fast-paced twitchy shooting of the 2000s versus the 7th gen console slogs. Only two weapons at a time? Nah, I got everything. The leak has a decent amount of levels in it, some of which are very underdeveloped and E3-ified for sure, but there's still something unique here. Unfortunately, it's difficult to get this thing running on a modern PC with Windows 11 if you don't want massive texture glitches, but things Thanks to a bunch of freaks in the community, we've got not just a mega patch, but the Duke Nukem Forever Restoration Project. Not quite human instrumentality, but a lot of steps have been taken to improve on these prototypes and turn them into a full made fan game. It's even got multiplayer. As it stands now, there's well over an hour of game that you can play, and while it's far from perfect, it's a glimpse at what Duke Nukem Forever 2001 could have been. And I think that's fascinating, especially considering we're now coming up on 12 years with Duke Duke Nukem being sentenced to the dead franchise zone. The restoration still slowly gets updates and it's neat, but if you're a fan of boomer shooters or the Duke at all, this leak is totally worth checking out in all of its trashy glory.
And Duke may have had a ways to go, but something like Dinosaur Planet was almost ready for release. The timeline where that's a major Nintendo 64 game is a strange one. But hey, I guess that makes sense considering this wasn't Fox McCloud's first rodeo. And next up, we're going to be talking about games that by all means were practically finished, starting with, well, Star Fox 2. Which technically came out on the SNES Mini and Nintendo Switch Online. But years before that, Star Fox 2 was one of the first major cancelled games to get leaked to the public. All the way back in 1999. That's older than some of y'all who write YouTube comments. Star Fox 2 is really weird. It's still got the rail shooting and all range modes you know and love, but this time has a bit of a turn-based strategy flair. Anytime you move on the map, so do the baddies. I mean, really, if you liked Argonaut Software's original Star Fox, you'll probably like this as well. Got more characters too. Where'd they go? I definitely played this as a kid and did my best to understand it before it was translated in all of its 10 FPS glory. This hardly counts now though. Then we've got something like Thrill Kill. You know, nearly the exact opposite. A game so violent it was given the world's first adults only rating and failed to be released. Let's see some of that violence. <laughs> Everyone watching this video? Ruined. Thrill Kill is actually pretty good. Developed by Paradox Development, the people behind the X-Men Mutant Academies, this is what happens when you take the jobbers from every mid-tier survival horror game and put them in a fighter. Belladonna, Cletus, Dr. Faustus. The cast here sure is something, but the actual combat mechanics are unique. Your standard arcade mode is a four-player free-for-all, where instead of health, you'll be doling out damage in order to increase your super meter. Whenever it's full, you get a chance to use an exit execution in order to kill another player in your typical PS1 gory fashion. Last person standing wins. What I'm trying to say here is that Thrill Kill died, so PlayStation All-Stars Battle Royale could run. They're basically the same, right? I've seen Thrill Kill setups at all sorts of conventions over the last 10 years or so. There's definitely a bit of a cult following for it. Also, if the gameplay seems familiar, well, that's because it got reskinned to become Wu-Tang Shaolin style. Yes, the one that came with the sick controller. Try doing Giza's 24 hit combo on this battle bad boy. There's actually a few other cancelled fighting games that were practically finished. You've got Tattoo Assassins, the Mortal Kombat clone. There's Primal Rage 2, which was canned because Atari thought no one would care, but hey, at least it got turned into a full-fledged book. Primal Rage The Avatars. D did anyone buy this? Next up, Tiny Toon Adventures. Total whiplash, y'all. I always thought it was tunes with a U and not two O's, so I guess this has got a bit of a Berenstein effect going on, but there are a lot of Tiny Toon video games over the decades. My favorite favorite being Acme All-Stars. That one's great. But in 2002, current license holder and publisher, Conspiracy Games would team up with an unlikely developer, Treasure. Yeah, like Sin and Punishment, Gunstar Heroes, Mischief Makers, Ikaruga Radiant, Silver Gun Treasure, Astro Boy Omega Force, you know it. Treasure is one of my all-time favorite developers, and I don't know why, but they found themselves working on a Tiny Toon Adventures game. And to this day, it was the last one that would be developed, even if it wasn't released. But why? I'm not sure really. Treasure was working on two titles here, one for the PlayStation 2 and another on the Game Boy Advance. The portable one, Buster's Bad Dream, did release, but Tiny Toons Adventure's Defender of the Universe was cancelled around the same time. It's also a fighter, one with a striking gameplay resemblance to their previous release, Rakugaki Showtime. It's kind of like a hybrid of dodgeball with platforming mechanics. You use a button to zoom over to balls or jumping points and do your best to beat the snot out of everything in sight. Surprising anyone who's not a Treasure fan, it's it's pretty solid. They could truly do no wrong. But it is baffling to me that this was cancelled when they even had a lot of the original voice actors come back and reprise their roles. It's even got that signature Tiny Toons humor that's actually funny. Who are you? And what's the capital of North Dakota? I'm even Dad. The capital of North Dakota is kind of. Wow, he's good. Look, he even got this. Soon all their base will belong to us. Crazy how this show ended in the early 90s and somehow wound up with a classic Newgrounds reference. Defenders of the Universe isn't just a lot of game, it's a full game. There's a complete voiced narrative from start to finish. There's cutscenes, a ton of levels, a multiplayer mode, credits, the whole shebang. This wasn't almost done, this was done and was planned to release in 2002 alongside Buster's Bad Dream, but it just didn't. There's no real reason given as to why this didn't hit the market. It even got an ESRB rating and was something that you could pre-order. It was just quietly pushed out of the limelight. It's not like the publisher went out of business, Treasure either. I can only theorize that something happened with the license, which is a massive shame because Defenders is solid. I've paid for considerably worse, which really just says more about me. While we're on the topic of games maybe not coming out due to licensing, 
Licensed games. These things getting the can is not an uncommon occurrence at all. I mean, a simple Google search will pop up with all kinds of results. Some you would look at and get excited for, others, not so much. I don't think anyone's out there mourning the loss of Austin Powers' Why Make Millions. Well, maybe Rockstar Games. I'm sure they had the highest of expectations. It's relatively common to poke around and find a prototype for something starring one of your favorite cartoons, movies, or anime growing up. I, for one, remember the brief period of time where there were Beethoven movies everywhere, and sure enough, there's a canceled Beethoven second The Quest for Pups. It's big enough to make its way to multiple magazines, but that's where it ends. Other times, you have nothing floating around but a rumor that stays unconfirmed for 17 years. Like Die Hard 64, poor Bruce Willis impersonation and all. Hmm, feels like it's missing a syllable, or four. Bit Studios Die Hard 64 was clearly being designed to follow in the footsteps of GoldenEye's wild success. It's even got a similar control scheme where you're holding down a shoulder button in order to manually aim. This was pretty early on in development, although it is interesting that they took the time to correctly depict John McClane as left-handed. I love seeing these test animations and slow motion bullet shots. This could have been neat. Weirdly, the developer did end up making a Die Hard game a few years later. Die Hard Vendetta for the everything in 2002. They even carried over some stuff like the slow motion. You just have to deal with a good bit of the uncanny valley. If you're more of a Pepsi guy with bald action stars, you could always download the prototype for Triple X. No, no, not that. Triple X Agency, as it's known on the title screen. A studio called Warthog Games was working on this. They were known for a few Tiny Toon licensed titles, actually, as well as good old Mace Griffin Bounty Hunter. They also wanted to make sure you could count backwards from five. This was going to be a mix of first and third person in action with shooting and wild stunts. Move over, Modern Warfare. Maybe, maybe not, Vin Diesel is here to save the day. I really hate Googling Vin Diesel XXX, but at least now we know this unreleased prototype wouldn't be his last game. Akira, as in one of the most important animated films of all time, Akira. This film and the manga have had the most dreadful luck with licensed adaptations ever since its inception. There's the terrible Amiga game, the NES visual novel, as well as everyone's favorite Psycho Ball for the PlayStation 2. You like pinball? How about pinball with clips of a depressing movie between each stage? Oh yeah. But also, back in 1993, there was an unreleased Akira for the Sega Genesis, one by Black Pearl Software. This was going to be a mix of several gameplay styles. You had bike chases, you had standard platforming, you even had first-person dungeon crawling, complete with mind exploding random nurses. Yuck. But, most importantly, you could recreate the film on the level select. Pet door. Canada. Pet door. Canada. Next up, Marvel. Sorry we're back so soon after Avengers, but where else am I gonna get to bring up the X-Women? There's barely anything available for this besides a few short trailers and a couple magazine descriptions, but it was gonna be a follow-up to the great X-Men Genesis titles, just with a little bit of Storm, Jean Grey, and Rogue action. It was gonna be one of the last first-party Sega titles in the 16-bit era, but it was never seen to completion. Kinda like Daredevil the Man Without Fear. No, not based on the Affleck film, thankfully, but it was is gonna have music by Finger Eleven. Daredevil's a funny one for me. That movie was originally the reason I thought he was so lame, but reading the comics in the last few years has made me love the character, so the cancellation of this hurts a lot. In the early 2000s, developer 5000 Feet was working on a low-budget game for The Man Without Fear before the movie's buzz kicked it into high gear. The prototype didn't have a public leak, but plenty of people have compiled research and shown off gameplay demonstrations. And what we got is something that looked like it was gonna fit somewhere between Spider-Man and Tony Hawk's Pro Skater, two things I like very much. Unfortunately, due to a mix of disagreements and allegedly much worse, the entire studio shut down and that'd be that. The only footage of this game in action was uploaded by P2P Online, and it's so cool seeing what this could have been. Even to this day, if there's one superhero I want to see starring in their own game, it's Daredevil. Or Magic, that'd be cool too. It'd be like Portal with violence, or Spliffgate with hell demons. Just make sure we hit up Finger Eleven. While we're here, we might as well toss up a note for all of the canceled and unreleased games that didn't have a leak. Like I said earlier, for every leaked prototype, there's hundreds of things that never see the light of day outside of like screenshots, video clips, or Discord arguments that happen at three in the morning. <laughs> More specifically, whether or not that canceled THQ Avengers would have been better than Crystal Dynamics. Look, everyone wants a good Avengers game. Marvel Ultimate Alliance is as close as we get, but that's like Avengers plus plus plus. THQ Australia was working 
on a four-player co-op Avengers game, but one exclusively in the first person. Hulk smashed some scrolls right through his eyes. After Square Enix's Critical Bomb, which we just released a video on, a lot of people were looking at this and wondering what 7th gen first-person Avengers could have been like. There's a lot of gameplay to see, but unfortunately, due to THQ struggling and eventually going bankrupt, this one was shut down. Anyways, here's a bunch of games that were canceled without a leak that make me really sad. True Fantasy Live Online. Yeah, that original Xbox MMORPG by level 5 of Dark Cloud fame. Literally one of the reasons I was so excited for Xbox Live back in the day. This thing was shown off multiple times in the early 2000s and had big promises. A massive fantasy world to explore, servers holding 3,000 concurrent players and voice chat between you and your friends. This obviously never happened and apparently left the relationship between Microsoft and level 5 in a bad spot. But anytime I watch clips of character creation, I get hyped all over again. True Fantasy is definitely one for just me. But speaking of Microsoft and developers splitting not amicably, Scalebound. Whew. Developers, developers. Developers. The Xbox One had trouble its whole life, from its initial announcement to the plethora of canceled games it had. So stick with 360, that's your message if you don't, well, don't like it. If but the one people bring up the most, besides Fable Legends and Phantom Dust, is Scalebound. I mean, you got Platinum Games who had made some pretty heavy hitters making this thing. It was the Japanese style of action game filling a massive gap in the Xbox library. However, Microsoft wanted Scalebound to be big and have four-player online co-op, something we realized with Babylon's fall that they may not be the best at. The pre-alpha gameplay shown off looked rough at best, and to this day, there's been no attempts at a revival. And years after it was cancelled, it got to a point where director Hideki Kamiya felt the need to apologize on behalf of them and Microsoft, and point out that they weren't experienced enough to do something with online features. Which just makes me wonder how Redfall happened. How about some Star Wars? There's probably no franchise with more bodies than Star Wars when it comes to unreleased titles. Jedi Knight 3, the Imperial Commando, which is a sequel to Republic Commando, Force Unleashed 3, First Assault, KOTOR 3, 1313, Battlefront 3. If your Star Wars game had the number 3 in it, kiss it goodbye. Battlefront 3 is the biggest casualty here, because it's a follow-up to the really solid originals. Allegedly, developer Free Radical was stopped, quote, two yards from the finish line, and just watching how smooth the battles transition from the sky to the ground is enough to blow anyone's pants off. When you think of DICE's microtransaction heavy Battlefront 2 and how that's gone, seeing this gameplay makes it even more disappointing. At a certain point, this is just depressing. I mean, there's Silent Hills, the final product of what PT was gonna be, the collab between Guillermo del Toro and Kojima before that turned into Death Stranding. There's the aforementioned Mega Man Legends 3 when Capcom was in its villain era. Did you sign up for Capcom Unity, actively express interest in, and help them design the thing? Well, if not, it's all your fault. Speaking of, anyone else remember Maverick Hunter? The Grim dark first person shooter we've all been waiting for. The Bomberman Zero Hourification of good ol' rock. That would have been something. Doom 4? Peace. Chrono Break? Trademarks only. Prey 2? I wish. EA's The Dark Knight? Watch the world burn. Although I don't think that would have topped Arkham. And how about the time Sega was actually trying to make a Sonic title for the Saturn? Wow. Sonic Extreme? Easily one of the biggest what ifs in that entire era. Sonic was notably absent from Sega's first 3D console despite being the reason they blew up, and the story of this development seems to be a massive train wreck. But at least Yuji Naka can now comfortably call the entire team at Sega Technical Institute liars from jail. Really? Over Final Fantasy VII Battle Royale? The prototype on this one is barely anything. I can definitely see how they would have a hard time working with this 2D, 3D look at the time, especially watching environments load in and out. I can't imagine performing a Sonic platforming in levels like this. Sonic Extreme might not exist, however, there are multiple groups doing their best to recreate its concept with fan games, and I just think that's neat. Now, can someone do a fan recreation of True Fantasy Life Online? Yeah, part two. Okay, thanks. Alrighty, one last thing to talk about today, and I can't think of a better release to take up the final slot here. It's pretty high profile. If you were a PC gamer growing up in the 2000s, there's not many other companies that had a higher stock than Blizzard Entertainment. They've had a couple of canceled and unreleased titles of their own, but easily the biggest in my mind is StarCraft Ghost. Yeah, yeah, way bigger than Warcraft Adventures, although it's hard to say no to Saturday morning cartoon thrall. <laughs> Ha 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 ha!
StarCraft Ghost was a big deal. It was a notable PC game developer stepping into the console world and firmly out of their comfort zone. It was expanding the world and lore of a beloved RTS with global popularity and trying something different. Ghost was heavily advertised, had a massive presence at E3 and in magazines. Wow, that really says Starship 3's Enix's answer to Final Fantasy, huh? Blizz teamed up with developer Nihilistic Software, the people behind Marvel Nemesis, in order to combine the unique sci-fi setting with the gameplay of something like Splinter Cell. You're not supposed to run and gun, you want to sneak around, get vantage points, and use cool gadgets and psychic abilities in order to stop the Zerg or what, whoever the villain was going to be. In Ghost, you'd take control of a psychic Terran named Nova who'd do, well, StarCraft things. A lot of the story elements were never released outside of an origin story novel, but it was going to take place after Brood War. After being initially announced in 2002, we'd get little breadcrumbs of information and trailers here and there. The developer would swap to Swing and Ape Studios, who were behind the amazing metal arms, and the goalpost just kept moving. 2006 rolls around, Blizzard announces that it's on indefinite hold as the next generation's already arrived, and then just like the title, it would ghost the game industry. Come 2014, 12 years after its announcement, and status as vaporware, and it was finally canceled, and that would be that. Or so we thought. February 2020. 18 years later, a prototype would leak onto the internet, and it's one with a lot of effort in it. There are several levels, full stealth mechanics, dynamic music, heat sensors for weak points, and lots of voice acting. The quote unquote legendary StarCraft Ghost was finally able to be played. I never thought that day would come, and I gotta say, it's not bad. You can actually boot it up on an original Xbox and play what feels pretty solid. Stealth, you got it. Atmosphere, feels like StarCraft, but down below. Kinda like Command & Conquer Renegade, but maybe a little better. Combat, you're definitely supposed to stealth. The plot here isn't really ironed out, the narrative just has you going and helping the Terran, and allegedly not much was prepared beyond this point. But the near hour and a half of gameplay that the prototype has is something that I had fun with, even if it was just a little underbaked. As we all know, none of this matters, as Ghost never, well, materialized. It seems like Blizzard really wanted to make this happen, almost stubbornly, but development wasn't happening fast enough to keep up with the rapid changes in the industry. The leaked build is from 2003, so it's the nihilistic software one, and if the developer changed a year after, there was no way that the full scope was going to be realized in time for the PlayStation 2 and Xbox era. But what I played is something that, if completed, could have been highly regarded. I mean, I'll always love hiding in lockers in the first person. I like Metal Gear. I see you, Blizz. Ghost might have gone to the Vaporverse, but the character and design of Nova sure didn't. She ended up becoming a playable character in Heroes of the Storm and making it into the StarCraft 2 campaign, comics, terrible AI renders, and fan animations, so there's always hope for a return here. But I seriously doubt it. For now, the best we can do is give Widowmaker a skin in Overwatch. $20, please. We've got to have money. It's probably different for everyone, but when I think of the highest profile unreleased video games, StarCraft Ghost is always the first that comes to mind. That and Half-Life 3. Y'all, I don't think it's gonna happen. These things, they take time. So there you have it. As many unreleased and canceled video games that I could fit into one video, right that you just watched. I wanted to lean more into the leaked prototype aspect for this one because there's so many things that exist as screenshots or videos, but being able to play something that by all means I shouldn't be able to play is really interesting. But hey, it's all in the name of games preservation. And if anyone wants to send me a full working copy of True Fantasy Live Online, uh, that would be great. I'll take things that'll never happen for 500. If you like today's video, check out today's sponsor, or if you want to support the channel, head on over to the Patreon, buy a t-shirt over at the Pixel Empire, hit the subscribe button, leave a comment, share it on your grandma's Facebook feed. Y'all know that everything helps the channel out so much. Anyways, that's enough for today. I needed something short after 100 plus hours of a vengeance, so here you go. I've been Austin, and catch me next time when we play some guilty pleasures. It's gonna get weird. Thank you all so much for watching. Special Patreon shout out to Aaron Kwolek, Aria Banana, Blackfoot Ferret, Blake Thomas, Cheeks, Chris Shelton, Doug Prince, DX Buster, David Molnar, Elijah, GM Pinks, Hey Quiggles, Idlewise, J Roos, Jacoby Fitzpatrick, Kevin Zanowski, Kieran Arder, Nick Irving, Ryan Telbert, and Vox. Thank you all so much for your generous support. Another video in the bag. This one was actually pretty hard to put together because a lot of these games only have a bare minimum of game to explore, and I like to be in depth with the 
the extra mechanics when I can. Hopefully you'll like it as much as I did in the very end. We're gonna have a lot of videos coming out over the next month that I'm really excited about, so stay tuned. As well as something I'm planning for the 10 year anniversary of my channel, so also stay tuned for that. This channel obviously wouldn't be a thing without y'all supporting it, so again, thank you all so much. Okay, I'm gonna go now, bye bye.